I am a historian and a philosopher of sorts, um, and I especially study the history of ideas and the history of philosophy, the history of how we have been thinking, uh, and the implications that uh, this history has for how we are thinking today and what we are doing as well. And I will, before I continue, I will just make sure that I share my presentation with you. So let's see if I can solve the technology part first. Uh, share. There we go. I work and I study at the Rachel Carson Center in Munich, Bavaria where I'm writing my dissertation on the environmental philosophy of Lewis Mumford. This guy, uh, he was an American theorist who wrote extensively on technology and many other subjects. Uh, and these are two books that are very relevant for the topic today. He wrote about uh, a lot about art and technology and the relation between the two. Um, he wrote on many, many subjects, but this was always in there somewhere. So I find him a, a very interesting thinker. Um, he also wrote a lot about environmental questions, and that is partly what I study as well. I study the interrelationship between humans, environment, uh, via technology. Lewis Mumford, he was uh, an anti-specialist in a way. He was a, he called himself a generalist. He uh, could easily, easily ha have earned a PhD degree, but he never did. Um, instead, he wanted to write about everything. And uh, I just mentioned him because it's relevant and especially if you find what I say interesting, these two books might be interesting for you too. Um, I will mention Mumford later, but it's just a, a footnote for now here. So this talk is partly based on uh, one of the lectures that I gave here at CODE. Uh, it is partly based on my dissertation and it is partly based on my general curiosity when it comes to philosophy and uh, the history of technology. I will tell a very wide story today. It will be very sweeping. Uh, as you will see, and I will be mainly focused on Western history and the English language. Um, it is easier that way, and that is also in, in the areas where I am most competent. Although I always recommend looking at other cultures and other times. Um, so let's see, let's start with this. So this is uh, from the Devil's Dictionary, which was a, a book published by uh, Ambrose Bierce, or, or a, a fake dictionary written in 1906. Uh, art, it has, this word has no definition. And I think uh, this is uh, not true, <laughs> but it has many definitions and it's hard to define. So in a way, maybe it has no one definition at least. Technology and art, these words can mean many things, um, and as we will see, they are both among the oldest words in European history. Over the course of millennia, these words have been used in different ways, and still today, people argue about what they mean. Technology, for example, can refer to the mechanical and digital objects we surround ourselves with, as well as the knowledge that we use to create and use and study them. Another understanding of technology is applied science, such as code is a university of applied science. That is scientific knowledge in practical action as opposed to theory. Um, art, on the other hand, like I said, can mean many things. Um, and we will, I, I will go through some of the possible meanings. But the abstract notion of art, uh, when we talk about art, the, the, as if it exists out there, um, that is a pretty new idea, as we will see as well. And uh, depending on where you come from, some of this might be very obvious, or it might be uh, surprising. So let's see, I'm curious to see. 
uh, where we will end up. So let's start at the beginning or at the beginning as we currently know it. The use of tools is often connected uh, to humans and for good reasons. But the fact is that simple tools were used before Homo sapiens, our species, existed. Crude, sharpened stone tools were even used before the whole genus uh, Homo existed. This image depicts an uh, Australopithecus, Australopithecus, I think, the proper pronunciation. Um, and this is one of the hominid species that may have, uh, may have used the oldest stone tools that we have found because there were several hominids at the time. And um, these stone tools that we have found, the oldest pieces of technology that we know of, if we include this in technology, uh, they are 3.3 million years old. Uh, and they were found in, in uh, Kenya. And there is, of course, a huge difference between a crude stone tool and a smartphone. But I find it fascinating that we use uh, the use of tools predate the existence of humankind. Um, and uh, it is also pretty interesting that it's not only hominids and, and humans that use tools. There are also examples of birds, for example, that use sticks for different purposes. So very simple tools. Um, and recently I saw a video of uh, monkeys flying drones. So if we give tools to them, they can also use them. The danger of prehistory, that is the, the part of history that precedes uh, written history. Uh, the danger is that we must extrapolate from fragments. So fragments from skeletons and artifacts, they do have a lot to say, especially thanks to modern scientific methods and technology. But even when complete, they are still fragments of the past. And uh, what I mean is that we can only observe what is left. Um, clothes, paintings, wooden tools, and tattoos are all gone. We have no idea when they first, uh, the, when they were invented, so to speak. Uh, we can make educated guesses, but there are no traces such as stone tools. And no matter how old findings we make, there is no way of knowing if they were novel or not. We can always find newer. Maybe stone tools are way older. There is also another layer that is wholly inaccessible to us, and that is uh, the layer of culture. Today, we tend to associate culture more with art than with technology, but we know nothing of the first art forms, the first music, the first coordinated dance. However, if we use the word art in a very inclusive way, we have evidence that suggests that it is not exclusive to humanity either, just as technology in a very exclusive, uh, inclusive way. So the oldest cave paintings in Europe date back some 62,000 years. And this is before Homo sapiens arrived at the scene. So these are very crude imprints of hands. This image is actually not from that cave, and these imprints are done by humans, but this is more or less what the Neanderthal paintings look like. So with Neanderthals, they did very similar, um, if we can call them paintings or artworks. So is this art? Well, that depends on how we use the word, but our Neanderthal relatives seem to have decorated their dwellings at least. And speaking of dwellings, I will not dwell too long in prehistory, um, but let us have a brief look at human cave paintings that I find hard not to describe as art. And this is one of the paintings from the Altamira cave in Spain. And due to its age, it was so controversial that the scientific community refused to believe in its authenticity for a long time. And maybe it doesn't look like much, uh, maybe it does, but mind that it was, it has been there for 36,000 years. And uh, it has surely deteriorated a bit since then. 
This is an attempt to illustrate what another much newer cave painting originally looked like, but the Altamira paintings probably looked quite similar in style and quality. So in this talk, especially since it's uh, recorded, I, I won't use copyrighted material. So that's why I can't show everything. But more, I have seen sim very similar uh, reproductions of the Altamira cave paintings. Art is not limited to visual art. Like I mentioned before, we cannot trace the first dances, songs, and other cultural expressions. But this flute is proof that there was prehistoric music. We have no idea how it sounded, but it was an instrument of culture. And the word instrument is important because today we have musical instruments, but also medical and scientific instruments. And when we use a thing for another purpose, we say that the thing is instrumental. We use instruments to create music, to diagnose, to measure, and to attain our goals. So maybe art and technology are not as different as they may seem today. Let's jump in time from prehistory to history, to ancient Greece. There is one particular word in classic Greek that is relevant for the discussion on art and technology, and that is techne. This is relevant because it is the root word of technology, but it means art. It also means skill and craft. So if you possess a techne, you possess the knowledge of how, um, of how to do and create things. We can still see this in the word technique, which is, uh, of course, of the same etymological root. And the history of this concept can be quite confusing, so I will try to simplify it a bit. Techne and art originally meant the same thing. Their only difference was that the techne is Greek and art is Latin. And uh, so the original meaning of art is skill or technique in a way. It is that by which we do or create things. It does not matter if we write a book or build a bridge. And this is why we can still talk about the art of writing and the art of bridge building. The sum of this is uh, that the hard division between art and technology is new or it is created in history. And in fact, it is only about 150 years old um, depending on how we look at it, for the ancient understanding survived until the late 19th century. The ancient philosophers sometimes contrasted art with nature, so, and this very wide notion of art. And nature was understood as a dynamic force. It was the way in which the world changes independently of our actions and our existence. It was on Earth, but also on the moon, even though they had different concepts of space and the heavens. Sometimes this was good for humans, uh, this nature, as when plenty of sunlight and rain made crops grow. And other times it was bad, as when a storm or a drought hit us. Art, in the wide sense of the word, was the way we could interact with and manipulate this dynamic nature to ensure our own survival and well-being. When we plant crops, we manipulate nature so that it acts in a way that helps us. This is why we have the, have the world artificial, artificial, which means that something is done by human hands and not naturally. Today, it has quite negative connotations, but in history, it has not and it was often a, a good thing. Um, and as an example, here is a, oh wait, no, I'm jumping ahead, but um, let's do it like this. Uh, here, here's a snippet from a 2,300 year old text, which has traditionally been ascribed to Aristotle. Uh, the, the famous Greek philosopher, the, the most famous probably, or together with Socrates and Plato. 
regardless of who the actual author was, it aligns very well with Aristotle's understanding of art. And I, I will read it. So remarkable things occur in accordance with nature, the cause of which is unknown, and others occur contrary to nature, which are produced through art for the benefit of mankind. For in many cases, nature produces effects against our advantage. For nature always acts consistently and simply, but our advantage changes in many ways. When then we have to produce, produce an effect contrary to nature, we are at a loss because of the difficulty and require art. For as the poet Antiphon wrote, this is true. By art, we gain mastery over things in which we are conquered by nature. And today we often contrast technology with nature, uh, but the, the whole concept also, the, any kind of art would be contrary to nature in this view. While I, in one way, am suggesting that art and technology used to be one, and the same thing. Um, I do not mean that the ancient Greeks had no words for the specific practice of creating artistic works. So we'll go back here. So for example, the word poiesis, which we find in the word poetry, was an important term. But in antiquity, this word was also more general and meant to create or even to fabricate. And uh, the German philosopher Martin Heidegger was famously emphasizing that the word poiesis means to bring something into existence, something that did not exist before. Um, and as Plato wrote in his uh, symposium, poiesis could have the same meaning as poetry has today, but it was nevertheless closely connected to techne, to art in the widest of senses. So in, in short, if an ancient Greek was building a house or writing a poem, he or she would not be doing something fundamentally different. It would be to create something which could be understood as both technical and poetical. The Greeks also used the word mimesis, which meant to imitate or to represent, as when you paint a tree or a portrait of a person. You also have the word aesthesis, which we today find in aesthetics, uh, but in ancient times it referred to sense perception. For example, when we feel pleasure by looking at an object, Aristotle wrote, we do so through aesthesis. So the word art can also refer to bodies of knowledge and to education. And it, and it is commonly used in the plural then. This is why, so as arts or the arts, this is why we can still get a bachelor's or a master's degree in arts, even when our subject has nothing to do with artistic work. In the United States and to some degree in Europe and in other places in the world, universities and colleges offer liberal arts education. Today, it often means uh, to study the humanities alongside another subject, such as the SDS um, courses taken at code. But liberal arts is a medieval concept that originally referred to a general education. So it was not to do something on the side, but it was rather to study everything. But of course, not everything, but that was the, the, the pretense or the idea. Uh, already in ancient Greece, a general education, the so-called paideia, was an ideal. Um, rather than becoming specialists, the ideal student would acquire many skills or arts. In the Middle Ages, this was formalized as the seven liberal arts. And first there was um, trivium in which the students studied grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Then there was quadrivium in which the subjects were arithmetics, geometry, music, and astronomy. These were all considered arts. They were skills that an educated person were supposed to possess. This was not a humanities education. It was the education of scientists, theologists, and philosophers alike. This ideal survived the Middle Ages, and it is why famous universal geniuses such as Leonardo da Vinci and uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe were proficient in so many subjects. 
for those of you who speak German, you will probably recognize this ideal in the word Bildung. And so these seven liberal arts were not only the only arts, however, only the most prominent, uh, or uh, they were the ideal. And art still referred to any skill. So scientists, dancers, shipbuilders, and poets were all considered artists. This is, this is the original meaning of the word artist. It was somebody that has skills, uh, somebody proficient in one or several arts. We can therefore still talk about the art of building, the art of engineering, and the art of programming, etc. Even if the uh, original meaning of the word art in which technology is included is still in use, we most commonly use it to talk about creative and fine arts today. That is the word we use when we say, I like art or I am going to an art museum. Today, art refers to aesthetic expressions and the arts usually refers to the humanities. So how did this change come about? So first, before I answer this, I must say that history is complex. There is rarely or never only one explanation to any phenomenon. But an important factor was the Industrial Revolution. So beginning in the 18th century, through which mechanical inventions got more and more important, um, then something happened. In the 19th century, uh, especially this, this became visible because the mechanical arts, what was called the mechanical arts, was eventually formalized as technology. Um, and for example, the famous uh, MIT uh, in the United States, which was the, the first university of technology, uh, it was formed in the 1960, no, 1860, sorry. Um, it was not until the 1800s that the modern meanings of technology, art, and science became general. And like I said, this is complex, and uh, some of these meanings existed before, but they were not as prevalent. So this is when they were more, they became uh, a part of, of the general language in a way, or at least the scientific. It's hard to, to say how widespread they were. In the 20th century, the breach between art and technology was complete, to simplify it a bit. This is when the humanities and the sciences grew apart into two different cultures, as C.T. Snow had it. I think this is an exaggeration in a way, but um, it is uh, a, a pretty famous statement that they are two cultures. Since then, an artist is necessarily an artistic person, a performer, a dancer, and a painter. For those who work with the technology, especially those who are really passionate about what they do, I think this divide may seem quite counterintuitive. Technologists, if I can use such a word, can also be artists. They can see beauty in what they do, whether it is the engineering of a bridge or the programming of softwares. The technological can be sublime. It is fully possible to look at a bridge as an artwork um, and not just in this bridge, but in the mathematics behind it, the calculations, the engineering. In the same way, science can both discover beauty and create it. Despite all this, there is still a rupture between art and technology. And it is perhaps most obvious to the people who primarily work with art and not at all with technology um, in the modern sense of the words. This is because technological artifacts are always something more than an artwork. It has utility, it has a function for which states, companies, and individuals are willing to pay. Uh, that happens to art too, but not in the same uh, degree. It is also true for artistic works, but the funding opportunities are not comparable. Both an engineer and an artist must be talented, but artists uh, need more luck in order to live on their work. Alternatively, they will have to follow the money 
to create art for marketing or, and other commercial uses. Or they will have to go the same way as technology in the aim at utility. It is easier to paint a house uh, or to get paid to paint a house than to paint a fresco, for example. We see the same structure in the humanities. It is harder to get funding since the projects are less likely to generate money when studying history or philosophy, for example, or literature. Regardless of whether we think this is justified or not, it is different from the past, and that is my point. So sure, there has never been a great market for artistic jobs, um, but in the past, there was not an economic divide between technology and art, and, and the same people usually work with both. Today, art is either a luxury, a means of relaxation and recreation, or reflection, or it is decoration, usually of works of engineering. So the decline of art. Is there a degradation of art going on? Many people think so. In the 1930s, Lewis Mumford, who I'm writing about, pointed out that the new means of communication, especially the telephone and its possibility of direct communication comes at a price. He argued that many of humanity's greatest achievements rely on indirect communication. Symbolism by words and images. For example, the art of writing a letter, which demands time and patience, is disappearing. There was nothing wrong in calling somebody on the phone, for direct communication has its uses. But Mumford pointed out that good communication is not always the same as fast communication. We need both. Another thinker who has written critically of technological developments is the French sociologist uh, Jacques Ellul. In the 1950s, he argued that the radio supplants rather than complements singing. We, we sing less, or at least uh, not in the same way. And he said that the realism of photography makes realistic paintings obsolete. Artists must either submit to utility and commercial aims or become increasingly mad and abstract, was his argument. Walter Benjamin is another famous theorist on the topic of art and technology. He argued that original works uh, of art, all the way back to prehistoric cave paintings, all have what he called a cult value. By being unique and therefore elevated, these works are perceived as having an aura. There is something that seems a bit magical with them. For example, there is just one Mona Lisa, and if you damage it, it is damaged forever. But in the age of mechanical reproduction, we can suddenly make hundreds, thousands, and even millions of copies. When everybody can have a copy of the Mona Lisa on their wall, the painting loses some of its magic. It becomes mundane, he argued. While many regards this as the decay of art, Benjamin believed that it was good. The cult value was exclusive, while the exhibition value, which was a, the contrary value, was democratic. Technological mass production makes it so that the art can come to us and that we don't need to travel to go to the art. Furthermore, he associated the aura and cult value with a personality cult of totalitarian ideologies such as fascism and national socialism. While all of these are good points, I think, um, the tragedy is that Benjamin was wrong in his predictions. He believed that the Soviet Union would help demolish the cult value, while in reality, its figureheads became objects of worship thanks to mass production. Not to speak of how Nazi Germany made use of technological reproduction, both for the propaganda machine and the war machine, so to speak. The irony continues, for capitalism was uh, the ideology that had most to gain from mass reproduction, not communism or Stalinism, or was not Stalinism at the time. Um, 
let's call it a totalitarian communism. Whatever we may think of Che Guevara, I think everyone will agree that uh, he would turn in his grave if he knew that he had become commodified as a product that you can buy on Amazon now. You can even buy face masks. How much money is he generating? So has art decayed? I think we should be careful before claiming this uh, because such discourses go hand in hand with extremist ideologies. The most prominent example is the term entartete Kunst, degenerate art, which the German Nazi party used for such art they regarded as ugly and dangerous. Um, it was degenerate and it had uh, similar effects on, on the people who, uh, who painted the, it and looked at it. But they even exhibited these works um, to show how horrible these artworks were. But ironically, this attracted more interest than the art approved by the Nazi party. What is safe to say is that art has changed. What we call modernist and postmodern art uh, consciously distinguishes itself from classical art, for example. And there are so many different streams and it, it's, of course, much more complicated than just these uh, currents. But to what extent this relates to technology can be discussed. Uh, however, as technological artifacts and gadgets become more and more integrated into our lives, it's hard to deny that there is a relation between the two. And moreover, thanks to technology, classical art has become much more accessible. Most people will rather listen to Justin Bieber than Beethoven, for example. Uh, but never before has so many people listened to Beethoven. For those who seek art, they will find it on Instagram, on Facebook and YouTube. It is always accessible. Even if we are critical of these platforms, it is there. And I think it's safe to say that classical music, literature, and visual art stand the test of time. Uh, many of these critics like uh, Jacques Lille and uh, Mumford, I'm pretty sure they believe that it would be all gone by now, but it's not. And also, it's the same thing with art, with a new art, with similar aspirations. There are, of course, new art that uh, wants to stimulate uh, reflection and, and uh, make people think. Uh, I think most art tries to do that in some way or another. As long as there are people who seek uh, to contemplate art, such art will persist despite the uh, production of culture that is mainly created to generate revenue and money. Another field that is very relevant when it comes to questions of art and technology is architecture. Houses are artworks according to some, machines to live in according to others. Whatever we think of architecture, its history reflects that of art and technology and its divide. The word architect is Greek and the word tect in, in architect is the same as the techne in technology. Architect can be roughly translated as master builder and traditionally, this role included the engineering of the structure as well as the aesthetical aspects. To make a long story short and somewhat simplified, the work has uh, or the work was divided between engineers and architects in the wake of the Industrial Revolution. Um, I'm sure it was divided before at some times too, but you see these general currents. Maybe the complexity of today's structures demand such a divide. Maybe we need it. But a common critique is that the architect is often reduced to someone whose job it is to make engineering look good. Um, it is cosmetical in a way. It becomes superficial as the architect who often lacks the sufficient competence in engineering has less control over the building. And so this image, uh, it's a photo of uh, Jakrebori, a small town in southern Sweden. It may look like a well-preserved medieval village, but it was built in the 1990s and 2000s. It is an example of the wish to build in classical styles again. 
the problem with this is that classical architecture was done by people who were both architects and engineers. The aesthetics and the structure belong together. While this does not have to be problematic, it nevertheless means that this village is just a facade. The use of modern technique and materials, which is not designed to hold for hundreds of years, means that these buildings are quickly deteriorating, at least in comparison to genuinely old buildings. So even if this town is beautiful, I, I find it very beautiful, uh, its architecture is not fully classical, it just looks classical. Unfortunately, we have lost the techniques by which many classical buildings were constructed. So even if we would like to, we cannot always do what was done in the past. And I find it hard not to relate this to the division between art and technology. Um, there is also this image that I find interesting because it also shows the contrast uh, of cars, modern cars and medieval buildings. One of the counter movements to the developments within house building is called organic architecture. This is Falling Water, one of the most famous works by American architect Frank Lloyd Wright, built in the 1930s. While this building certainly belongs to style and has a certain style, it was expi explicitly designed with its environment in mind. Wright was uh, very engaged in the engineering as well as, uh, uh, as the architecture. And even the materials were chosen based on the surroundings. This house was never made to be reproduced um, and a similar house was only to be built in a similar environment. While not all houses must be built like this, of course, it shows how art and technology can be integrated within a, a common framework. And from a, an ecological standpoint, I, I have no idea if this building is very ecological, uh, maybe it just looks like it, but at least to consider the local environment makes a lot of sense. So how do we bring art and technology together again? Well, I don't think we can, and I don't think we should. And I will try to explain why uh, this does not have to be a bad thing, but that it is uh, a question still that relates to the very fate of our species, to be a bit dramatic. This, by the way, is um, a fresco uh, by Diego Rivera made in 1934. It was made for first made for the Rockefeller Center, but it was a bit too provocative for them, so they uh, decided to tear it down, and this is his reconstruction. But it was called Man at the Crossroads originally, and it inspired me uh, with the um, title of this talk. Um, I might have misled you with the title, for it may seem like I mean that humanity must choose between art and technology, but crossroads does not necessarily imply a binary choice. It refers to, usually refers to a four-way junction. And uh, I will try a metaphor here and see how it works. I hope I will not confuse you too much. So this I would see as crossroads. So first, um, which is maybe not intuitive with the arrows here, um, we can choose to go backwards, trying to regain what has been lost. Such attempts are often futile uh, because as time goes by and history is written, new conditions create a new reality. And often we end up with a weird pastiche as, as Yakiboy, for example, the village that looks old but is not. Um, and the dividing line between art and technology cannot be undone. Uh, I believe that it is here to stay. Um, we could instead take a turn to the right towards a society where technology flourishes, but at the expense of art. This road has been traveled before. It leads to a place in which technology is the groundwork and art is reduced to cosmetics, to making engineering look good. Often a, a question about money. If we take a left turn instead, we go towards the destination at which uh, art is our guiding star and where technology primarily serves as a tool for artistic expressions. This will appeal to some, but it is a utopian vision that is not anchored in the world in which we live. 
we may need art to nourish our soul, but we need technology to make sure that we can also feed our bodies. The last option is to go straight ahead. And this does not mean, in my analogy or metaphor here, it does not mean to continue along the path that we have taken so far. In this metaphor, we have continually been taken, uh, taking turns to the right, going in circles without knowing it. If we go straight ahead, we will end up in uncharted territory for us as a society. And as a species, we have never gone there before. Along this path, we don't, do not choose between art and technology, and we do not try to merge them into one again. Instead, we make them work together. So metaphors, they are deceiving. Uh, and this was one of the things I taught uh, in my classes. Um, it's a common fallacy and just because it looks the same uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that it works they they may i don't know how convincing this was but if it's convincing be skeptical um they are deceiving for because they make complex things seem easy and trivial so let us leave this image of the crossroads and look at how the bringing together of art and technology can be realized and how do we do this I think we do it by seriously talking about the purpose of technology, by seriously asking ourselves and each other, what should we do with technology? I will try to explain what I mean. One way of understanding technology is as knowledge about creating and using means for an end. This is a very simple scheme that I have never, that I nevertheless do find uh, very useful. It includes the scientific aspect, the practical aspect, and the technological artifacts that we create and use. So when we want to remove a tree, we may want to use a simple tool such as an ax as a means, or a motor-driven machine tool such as a chainsaw, or perhaps a gadget such as a smartphone so that we can call and hire somebody else to do the job for us. We can even try to kick it down or shake it until the roots come loose. And if we have a good technique and if the tree is not too big, of course, we might just succeed. So understood as knowledge of means for an end, technology can include techniques, tools, machines and gadgets and many other things too. It is the knowledge of how to construct and apply these things. The problem with this scheme and its simplicity is that we tend to focus so much on the means that we forget the end. We, we forget the purpose or we, we let it be relative and not absolute. Maybe that tree needs to be there to avoid soil erosion, biodiversity loss and climate change. The tree might have a purpose at least if we're to believe philosophers such as Aristotle and Immanuel Kant. But it at least has an ecological function. And before applying technology to cancel this function, we might want to ask ourselves if that is what we should and want to do. What I am getting at is that technology is used to achieve our purposes, but maybe technology has or should have a higher purpose that guides us. Maybe it should not be used for whatever we would like to do, but help us achieve a common goal, a common good. Without such a purpose, we will just magnify the power of everybody and technological progress can happen without and even at the cost of social progress and ecological sustainability. And this is where we are today. We have technologies to achieve marvelous things, but there are also advanced technologies to kill, to torture, to maim and to slaughter. We have neutron bombs designed to kill all life forms without hurting the infrastructure, preserving only the technology. We have atom bombs that can annihilate cities, nations and continents. The most destructive of these tools are seldom used, thankfully, because they have a secondary purpose, which is dominance and or power as the, the Cold War serves to prove. But technology has many other uses, many of which are harmless in themselves. And uh, for most worldly purposes, we will probably find technology we can use to achieve them, or we can try to invent one. 
But even if this is unproblematic and desirable for many people, such use of technology has cumulative and undesired effects as well. The blind use of technology for whatever purpose we might have leads to collateral damage to so-called externalities. Our means do not only achieve their purpose, they also have a lot of unwanted side effects. This is why we have pollution, plastic in the seas, carbon emissions in the sky. We can and we do use technology to solve these problems, but my point is that they are all unwanted side effects of technology in the first place. Techno optimists or technological optimists believe that technological development is, prog uh, development is progressive and that over time, all or most of these problems can be solved by technology. And maybe this is true. Maybe technology can be perfected or maybe artificial intelligence will help us uh, combat or avoid the problems that follow our technological activities. But I would call this a gamble. The optimists of the 19th century did not foresee how technology would be used in and after the two world wars. That was something the world had never seen before. We had seen big wars, but not with uh, technology used in such a way. And they made this mistake because they conflated uh, social and technological progress. They believed that they belonged together by necessity. And they can do, but not by necessity. Another surprise was the exponential growth of ecological destruction, which has skyrocketed, especially since the 1950s. Today, it has gone so far that some scientists say we live in the Anthropocene, a new geological era in which humanity has become a destructive force of nature. Others call it the Technocene, because without technology, none of this would have been possible. This is quite a depressive description of our world, uh, its current state and its current trajectory. But the last thing we need is to lose our hope. We will need it uh, so that we can make the best of our technology. And to do this, I think we need to look at art. Art can be created for its own sake. L'art pour l'art, as the French maxim goes. But even when it is its own purpose, it usually does some good. Many, if not most people, find pleasure in creating things, uh, also technology. And even if the artist doesn't care about what others will think, many people appreciate works that were created in such a spirit. But art can also explicitly be created for other purposes. And they do not have to be commercial ones. Many times they are meant to be shared and meant to have good effects. And in the same way, we can direct technology towards something good not just see it as a means or a tool for an instrument for anything. In the beginning of his ethics, Aristotle wrote that every art is thought to aim at some good. What he meant was that we need a goal. We need an overarching purpose. This purpose he called eudaimonia, a word I won't even write here, but it means happiness. But just like all Greek words, we must understand it differently. By happiness, he meant flourishing. He meant living a good life. If this sounds too abstract, listen to Carl Sagan, the, the famous astronomer. In the Q&A after a lecture in 1994, he said that the problem we stand before is that we take pride in what we are and not in what we do. He continued, let's make a planet in which nobody's starving. Let's make a planet in which men and women have equal access to power. Let us make a planet in which no ethnic group has, its, uh, has it over another ethnic group. Let's have a planet in which science and engineering is used for the benefit of everybody on the planet. And my personal idiosyncrasy, let's have a world in which we go to other worlds. And for those who don't know him, this was something he dreamed a lot of. There will never come a day when the whole world agrees on what is good. Such a utopia would be a castle in the air. But there might come a day when we talk more about purposes and less about tools, uh, more about ends and a bit less about means. This would not be against technology. It would make it more efficient. Because true efficiency is not uh, just to produce as much as possible, for example. It is relative to the purpose. It means achieving our goal 
and we need to ask ourselves what this goal is. Maybe this still seems quite abstract, um, but there are a few examples of how this is already happening. Within the humanities, there is a new current, relatively new, called the digital humanities. This can be understood as the attempt of humanities scholars to study the digital, um, as well as to make use of digital tools and resources. Many scholars are already well acquainted with information seeking, but not everybody is proficient in working with big data, geographical information systems, and programming. Why should not philosophers learn about these things too? Maybe, uh, maybe philosophy programs should have a, a minor in, in programming, for example. There is another current called uh, the environmental humanities in which scholars no longer study humans in the abstract, but in relation to the world around them, including that of technology. And lastly, there are efforts such as the SDS program at Code. This last semester, I have been teaching tech students not only about philosophy, ethics, and history, uh, I have at least tried to teach them how to philosophize. I hope that they have learned a lot uh, that they can use in the future, both in their private lives and in their jobs. Um, I for sure have learned a lot, since uh, these students know a lot that I do not. Um, this whole talk is partly an outcome uh, of my teaching experience and the reflections I have made in, in between the classes. So these are just some examples of how art and technology, both widely understood, can be brought together within a common framework. With such efforts, we have nothing to lose, but everything to gain. And uh, that is all for me. Thank you.